Good morning, everyone. So today we're going to carry on by looking at the social cultural factors, which is a topic that we've studied now since lockdown. Last lesson, we looked at the factors that affect in our participation, and it's kind of continuing on from that, but we're going to be focusing specifically on age, gender and ethnicity. So age plays a vital factor when we think about who actually participates in sport. So if we go back to childhood and we think of ourselves when we were three, four years old, the first thing I can remember doing was having my first swimming lessons. Um, I remember going to the leisure centre and just loads of clubs being made available to me. Entering school, um, the PE staff um, offered so many different activities for me during lessons and after school. So at a young age, participation levels were actually really high and the government try and focus on making sure that children are healthy. The biggest problem though is after the age of 16, participation levels drop. Now we have to think why this is. So certain factors could be that our priorities change. So when we're 16, we're in year 11. So we've got our GCSEs to think about. A lot of time is used up there to revise or to work rather than exercise. We then got to think about post 16. So that's where people might leave school or they might have their first job. And what happens then is PE or sport becomes less of a priority. People become so tied up in the busyness of their job that when they finish work at say five o'clock, that's all they want to do is come home, have their food and relax, which is fair enough. However, this is a massive problem because participation levels drop, meaning that these people, as they become adults, lose their fitness and become more at risk of having vital diseases that cause a lot of pressure on the NHS. What's also interesting to note here is that participation levels will increase a little bit during retirement age. And again, why is this the case? So when we retire, so anybody over the age of around 60, um, they finish their jobs, which means they have much more time on their hands. So there are many initiatives, again, that the government have organised to allow retired people to exercise. You might notice when you go to a leisure centre in the mornings, there are a lot of aqua aerobic lessons or just swimming lessons for individuals aged 60 or above. Now, this is really important because when we get to that age, we are more at risk of being ill. Uh, we are more at risk of falling. We lose our balance. We lose our flexibility. So exercise is really important. So although there's a slight incline or a slight increase in participation when we retire, there's still a massive issue. So just to reflect with age, it's quite high when we're young. When we get to 16, it plateaus, so it kind of stays the same. At around 20, it drops significantly. So when we become adults, most people have children and have their own families so they don't exercise at all. And when people retire, physical acti activity levels increase a tiny bit, but not enough to make us active people. So gender is also a factor that affects our participation. And what this means is there's a difference between the amount of girls who take part in sport and the amount of boys that take part in sport. So the science is there, the data is there. It suggests that boys are twice as likely to participate in sport than girls are. Now, again, this is a massive topic that we need to consider and we need to look at why this is the case. So certain factors that might cause less girls to take part in sport could be limited choices. Now, unfortunately, sport is stereotyped to 
football and rugby being a boys game and netball and hockey being a girls game. Now, we are moving into a generation where this is unacceptable, where we try and encourage girls to take part in football and rugby, the same as getting boys to participate in netball and hockey. However, girls are less likely to try something new. So in terms of choices, girls tend to stick with netball because it's something that they feel comfortable, it's something where they feel feminine, and it's something that they do enjoy, which is good. However, um, there's a fear of trying new things. On a bigger scale, uh, there are less opportunities for girls. So for someone your age, if you really enjoy sport, there's not many opportunities for when you leave school. In comparison to boys, the opportunities to become professional athletes, whether that's in football, in rugby, in athletics, in tennis, there is so much more. Obviously, money plays a factor in this as well because there are professional sports available for men, whereas with women, there are less opportunities for them to get paid or they are paid a lot less. So I always use the example of a male football player that can earn up to £250,000 a week. How incredible would that be? So if I was a 16-year-old boy, I'd be really, really enthusiastic to become a professional football player. However, I have a housemate who is a footballer and she's had 100 caps now for Wales. Um... Her situation would mean being paid £400 a month, so that's £100 a week. Now, for a 16-year-old girl, that's no incentive to want to leave school and to become a professional footballer to only receive £100 a week. So, in terms of opportunities, there are less, and there are less opportunities to become professional. So, when people leave school... Girls will tend to forget sport and focus on their career, whereas boys might want to pursue this when they leave school. And like I said, some boys, um, they can have a job and still play on weekends um, every weekend, whereas girls, they're in a completely different situation. Girls on a whole are less competitive So the win and the lose environment, girls don't tend to enjoy. In comparison to boys, um, if you uh, put the boys into a a situation where you play a game, they're happy. Uh, On a wider level, so if we look at the media, so that's anything to do with um, the television, the radio, the newspapers, the magazines... Uh, unfortunately, women do get less media coverage. So we don't really know what's going on in the world of women in sport. Whereas if we turn Sky Sports on, we could probably watch a male football game every hour of the day. Similar to a rugby game. We can always watch it on television. We'll always be able to hear it on the radio. And we'll always be able to go to the back page of any newspaper to find all the news and updates about male sport. Body image issues is a major factor, especially for females, um, because sport uh, has an image that isn't very feminine. So a lot of girls don't like to sweat, they don't like to get dirty, um, and there's a lot of pressure on looking good, having makeup and nice hair, um, and obviously sport goes against all that. Uh, which causes a lot of females to not want to engage in sport. However, if we were to argue against this, it's really important to know how far women have come in sport. So in the last five years in particular, um, the Women's World Cup that was in France in 2019 uh, filled their stadiums with supporters It was on TV for people to watch. 
the same for Netball World Cup. So that was in Liverpool and that had really good media attention. I think most tickets were sold out within like the first week. Uh, and again, raising the profile of netball in particular. Wimbledon, um, whenever you watch Wimbledon during the summer, there's always a singles men's game and a singles women. So there's always opportunities for us to watch the women. But another important factor here is that Wimbledon will give the same prize money for the women as they would for the men. So that's completely equal, which is really nice to see. Then you've got the Tokyo 2020 Games, which is obviously now going to be in 2021. But that's another event, or the Olympics itself, is a good way to show equality, to show that men and women are fair. There's a 100 meter men's final, there's a 100 meter women's final. There's a, a shot put event for the men, and there's a shot put event for the women. And it's a really good opportunity for us to see both men and women engaging in a sport where the world comes together to watch, encourage, and support. So disability is another factor that affects our participation. And ultimately, a disabled individual is less likely to participate than a non-disabled individual. There are many factors uh, about this. So we've got physical. So individuals who are disabled are less likely to, to attend certain clubs because they need appropriate equipment they need appropriate facilities and access. And this makes it really difficult. And a lot of the time, an individual would have to travel further than a non-disabled individual. Another factor would be psychological reasons. So again, individuals who have a disability of some sort, lacking confidence, lacking the attitude to pluck up the courage to, to try and attend um, sports that have been adapted to suit their needs. And ultimately, we and the media need to try and combat this issue by supporting uh, and watching these events to make individuals feel confident, feel better about participating in these sports. Another factor would be opportunities. And again, unfortunately, opportunities are limited for individuals who are disabled because, again, there aren't enough specialist staff to coach these individuals and also you need some expertise. So to understand how the sport is played um, because obviously it's adapted. So whether that's um, because uh, wheelchairs are included within the sport or whether certain objects are changed. So the shape of a ball or the shape of a racket is changed to meet the needs. Now, we need specialist staff to do this, and unfortunately, there are a lot less than there are for able-bodied sports. So the task for this week is a six-mark question. Discuss how age, gender, and disability might affect individuals from participating in sports. So ultimately, what we expect to see here is three paragraphs one for age, one for gender, and one for disability. And I'd like you to go through each one explaining how age allows us to participate in sport and how age might prevent us from participating in sport. The same for gender. How does gender allow some people to participate in sport and others not? And the same for disability. How does that allow some people to participate and others not? In order to achieve the six marks, we expect to agree and disagree or to discuss both points and provide sporting examples. And I'm hoping this PowerPoint with the examples that I've given is going to support you in order to achieve the six marks. Once you've done this task, could you please email your answers to me or Mr Jones, depending on who your theory teacher is. I hope you've enjoyed and thank you for listening.